Welcome to the video lecture for the Guide to Computer Forensics and Investigations, 5th edition. Here we're looking at Chapter 9, which is Digital Forensics Analysis and Validation. What we're looking at for this chapter is determining what data to analyze, explain the tools used for data validation, and explain common data hiding techniques. So we've already talked about tools in previous chapters, chapter six. So we're not gonna spend so much time about uh, going in depth in the tools. We're gonna talk about the methodology for the data validation using those tools. So how do we know what to analyze? So examining and analyzing the evidence depending on the nature of our investigation. How much data do we have? How much data is complete? What data uh, types do we have? So we have to understand the scope of our investigation. We have this phenomenon called scope creep, and this is where we have an investigation expands beyond our original description or beyond our original scope. And scope creep happens for many different reasons. It could be as simple as uh, unexpected evidence is found. It could be because a primary attorney asked us to investigate or examine more. It could just be the increasing the time and resources to extract and analyze the data that we already have. Scope creep has become more common, especially throughout criminal investigations, because they require more details and explanation of that evidence. So to help prosecutors fend off this type of an attack from defense attorneys, we get more of a predefined scope and we try to stay within that scope. New evidence often isn't revealed to prosecution. It's become more important for prosecutor teams to ensure that they have analyzed the evidence exhaustively before a trial because again that builds that, that scope creep. So a good question is where to start. Begin a case by creating the investigation plan that it defines key things. You set the goal and the scope of the investigation. From the scope, you can define the goals. From the goals, you should be able to collect the materials needed to meet those goals, and you'll break them into more manageable chunks, milestones, and tasks. That way you kind of have a project that you can now complete. The approach you take depends largely on the type of case you're investigating. Is it corporate? Is it civil? Is it criminal? And that kind of dictates the scope and the goals, and then it'll shift the requirements based off of what type of case. So let's get a general working structure. So we have a general structure, I think about 11 steps. First, if we're doing, using a targeted drive, we're going to be using a recently approved wiped drive, making sure that it is wiped. Uh, we're going to inventory the hardware on the suspect's computer, note condition in, uh, of the seized device. For static acquisitions, we're going to remove the original drive and check the date and time values in the uh, system CMOS, because again, we want to be able to duplicate and verify everything that we're doing. We're going to document how you acquired the data from the suspect's drive. We're going to be processing the drive's content methodologically and logically. Methodologically. I cannot say that word today. Uh, within a method, methodology. We're going to list all folders and files on the image or drive that we're working with. We're going to examine the content of all data files in all fo uh, folders and all subfolders. We're going to recover file contents for all password protected files if need be. We're going to identify functions of every executable file that doesn't match hash values. So we're going to look at all programs and we're going to verify that those are the correct programs. We're going to maintain control of all evidence and findings. And the 11th one, which isn't really listed here, but the 11th one is always document. Document, document, document. Documenting is so important. And that's one thing that we don't often 
thoroughly do enough. We're going to refine and modify our plan uh, based off the information that we have, knowing the type of data that we have, knowing what t uh, the size of data that we have, knowing how much data that we have. That all has to be accommodated for in our plan. A good key to success is recognizing that your plans must be flexible. So what are we using to analyze the data? You can use things like OS Forensics to analyze the data. Uh, it kind of goes back to, well, what are you analyzing? Is it a Microsoft format? Is it a Linux format? Is it a Mac format? What type of tool? In case is a big one. OS Forensics is another big one. Uh, it just kind of depends. Also depends on what are you trying to do. Are you trying to mount uh, specific files? Uh, mount image files? Here our author focuses very heavily on OS Forensics, but that's just one of many tools that are out there. Uh, using the index features of OS Forensics, you can index data. Uh, if you have the lab book, or if you have the book, you can actually follow along with it in Chapter Lab. Here's what OS Forensics uh, looks like. Here's the entire process going through it. Here's how we add case files, how we add uh, icons, how we add uh, indexing. So let's talk about data validation. So first thing we have to realize is we have to ensure the integrity of the data collected because it's essential for presenting evidence in court that someone else is able to verify. Example, using Pro Discovery loading an image, it will run a hash and compare the hash values with the original hash. Are they the same? If they are the same, then you can conclude that they are identical disks. If the hash values are different, then that means they are different images. It doesn't matter if it's a few bits difference or more. If they're not the same, they're not strip or uh, bit stream copies. Thus, they are not the same, and so they may not be allowed to enter into evidence into a court. So using the advanced hexadecimal editor ensures that data integrity is present. Advanced hex editing offers features not available in digital forensics tools, such as hashing specific files or sectors of a hard drive with the hash values in hand. WinHex is the one that we've been doing. It provided both MD5 and SHA-1 hashing. Here is our WinHex editor. We can actually choose how we do our uh, hashing. We can also hash specific file types or file extensions or specific files and we'll get a hash value. That way, maybe the entire image is not matching hashes, but the key files that we're looking at are matching hash files for the, the original file or the original files, they're matching the hash of our copied ones. And if that's the case, even though the entire disk isn't matching, as long as we're able to provide the hash values for both our original and our copy, we can say that that copy is hashed as identical as our original. Thus, we can use it. Not having to worry about if the original disk itself is the same as our copied disk. Basically, we're looking at all files compared to just a single file, and if all of the files are hashing together to create the same value as the original as our copy is, as opposed to an individual copy, or an individual file. Advantages of recording our hash values is you can determine whether the data has changed or not. We can do block-wise hashing. This is the process that builds a data set off of hash of sectors from the original file. 
that we can see which sectors have the correct hashing values as opposed to those that don't. That way we could see if there was sectors that were edited or modified. We could then would examine the sectors on the suspect's drive to see whether it, any other sectors match. If an identical hash value is found, you have confirmed that the file was stored on the suspect's computer. So we could be looking for, we have a photo, for example, and we hash the photo, and we could be looking for a duplicate of that photo on that suspect's computer. That's one way of being able to search for specific files. Otherwise, you could search for all photos and then compare each individual photo to the one that you're trying to retrieve of, but that takes a lot more time. If we have the file or the photo that we're looking for and we have its hashing value, then we could just search for the hash value of that photo. Makes it a little bit faster. This is known as hash values to uh, discriminate data. Access data has its own hashing database no, uh, called the known file filters, or the KFF. The KFF is a known program file from view and contains uh, has lots of values of known illegal files. That's kind of subjective, but it is there. It will compare known file hash values with files on the suspect's computer. Thus, you're able to quickly search that database for known illegal content. Interesting is Pro Discovery has its own uh, file system with its own database. It has a .eve file, which contains metadata that includes things like hash values. It does have a preference that you can enable for auto-verifying image checksums when we are loading image files. If the auto verification image checks someone hash values in the EVE file metadata, uh, metadatabase don't match, then Pro Discovery will notify you that the acquisition is corrupted and thus not considered reliable. So there are certain tools out there that kind of help do a lot of this guesswork for you when it comes to validation. We have the raw format image that doesn't contain metadata, so you must validate them manually to verify integrity. We have the access data's FTK imager when selecting the eyewitness or the uh, smart format, so the E01 or S01 formats. Again, you're double checking and verifying hash values. They have built-in validation features that you just have to make sure that you're doing them. So here is the preference for the auto verify image checksum feature. Here is again the Pro Discovery basic structure. So let's talk about hidden data. Data hiding changes or manipulates the file to conceal data or information. Techniques can include things like hiding the entire partitions, changing file extensions, setting up attributes that are hidden, uh, bit shifting, encryption, password protection, uh, stenography, depending on what you're trying to hide, how you're trying to hide it. So there are lots of different ways to hide data. So it's common, one of the first techniques is to change the file extension to hide data. If you're looking for a JPEG and you change it to PDF, then obviously that file won't be a PDF anymore, or that file won't be a JPEG anymore. It'll be notified as a PDF, even though in reality, it's not. And then you can manually manipulate it based off of whatever criteria you have. Advanced digital forensics tools, check file headers, and then compare the file extensions to see if there's a discrepancy. So that's a, a tool that is commonly used. Another technique for writing data is selecting the hidden file attribute and uh, the file uh, attributes. Hiding partitions could be simple as hiding the uh, drive letter. 
In Windows, you can actually do a disk part command to remove the drive letter, thus making it unreadable. You can detect whether partitions are there. You can verify to see if all data is present. If not all data is present or not all of the data is being used, you can analyze the additional space to see what's going on. Core Discovery Basic does have a hidden partition tool, and the partitions do appear as the highest available drive letter in the set in the BIOS. So again, every acquisition tool has typically has a way to verify and present hidden partitions based off of that tool's information. Here's an example of a hidden partition. Hiding partition again in the Prediscovery Basic. You also have things like uh, marking bad clusters. In FAT, you have the ability to mark sections of the hard drive as bad sectors, thus not being able to use them. But you should be able to mark a bad cluster and then use that space to hide sensitive data. Bit shifting is a very common thing also. This is where some users use a low-level encryption program that changes the order of binary bits. Basically, it makes altered data unreadable. This is done to secure a file. Users will run an assembly program to scramble the bits and run another program to restore the scrambled bits. Bit shifting changes data from readable code to non-readable code. WinHex includes a feature for bit shifting. Here's an example of bit shifting in WinHex. We can actually say how we're doing our shifting. WinHex will do the shifting for us and then we get to read the data. So, stenography is also part of there. It comes from the Greek word for hidden writing. It allows us to hide messages in certain other uh, programs typically found in videography or videos or photos. Stignalysis uh, sten is a term for detecting and analyzing stenography files. It could be simple as a digital watermark. And that could be done for like patterns of files or images. Again, typically stenography is having data that's not visible to the end user. A way to hide data is using stenography tools. A lot of free tools out there that allows us to encrypt or add in files or add in text to a file and then be able to send that whether it's encrypted or not based off of that criteria. You also have the ability to encrypt a plain text file using PGP and insert encrypted text into a stenography file. Stenography methods could be Stego only known covers, known messages, chosen Stego or Stegen message attacks. The, these are just different ways to do stenog stenag stenag analysis. Uh, it's stenography analysis. Stenag analysis. Stenag I cannot pronounce that word tonight at all. To decode our files, we would uh, encode or decrypt our files. Many encryption programs will use a technology called key escrow. The key is the way that we unlock files, depending on the bit size. There are lots of standalone tools like LastBit or Access Data's PRTK, um, John the Ripper, Passware. All of these are used for password. Uh, breaking or for password recovery. This is not a it's extensive list. This is just a very small basic list. 
we could always brute force attack it. That's trying every combination. We could do a dictionary attack, which is going to be a word list that we'll go off of, trying different words that we have a known dictionary for. Mini programs, you can build profiles. That way, we're looking at the hash values of the password and trying to recover that. Rainbow table is going to be one example of that. That's where we have several different hash values and we're comparing hashes and known hash passwords. Salting passwords. This is altering hash values and making cracking passwords way more difficult. And that is actually the end of this chapter. Again, we're going to be doing some of the sublabs within the chapter in different videos and they're going to be coming soon. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.